Welcome back to Hope Side Whispers. Today is August 25, 2023. Hope you enjoyed that very beautiful song by Miss uh, Naka there from Spicer College. So we are glad to be able to meet uh, again after a busy week and uh, with so much happening, as always. But we are given the assurance of rest and restoration. And uh, so here is a quotation for your consideration. This is the fourth week, which is focused on evangelism or outreach. This is by President George, the late George H.W. Bush, the senior Bush. He said, there could be no definition of a successful life that does not include service to others. There could be no definition of a successful life, a life that is based on service to others. That's a great quotation for us to remember. We're glad to have Mrs. Evangeline David, and she will now offer the opening prayer. Our gracious and merciful Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us, dear Father, bringing us to another week where we can worship you, dear Father, in thy holy day. We ask that that would be with, and we thank you for being with us and taking care of us, dear Father. You are a protector and you do everything for us. A friend uh, sent me a picture of Molly after it got burnt. And the Seventh-day Adventist church still stands. God is in control. We pray for, uh, for the sick amongst us. If there are any, we ask that that would be with um, Hope Side, dear Father. We started as a small group and are learning the book of Daniel. Daniel teaches us the times before we are going to heaven. Let us all get prepared. Dear Father, be with our children as they go on Monday to school so that they will have um, a safe, trip going and coming to uh, coming from uh, school as we say, see the signs of the times all over the world we know that the world is not going to last help us to be ready for jesus coming and share the message to others who don't know about the lord dear father we commit all these things in the name of at your feet dear father and dear Father, we ask that thou would bless it, give us strength, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We are continuing to study the book of Daniel. We had a great uh, presentation yesterday and the two other times previous to that. And so today is the fourth part uh, of uh, the presentation on understanding the book of Daniel. And so here is Dr. Roy and Jerry to present today's topic. Happy Sabbath. I want to welcome each one of you in the loving name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to this study of the book of Daniel. And it has been our desire to understand this book, especially how it relates to us living in the last days. As was mentioned in our prayers, the importance of this book for God's people in the last days, and especially the important responsibility God placed upon us as the remnant church to present this prophetic message and to prepare this world for the soon coming of Jesus. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and their study will play a significant role 
in finishing God's message, the end time message in these days we are living in. In studying this book of Daniel, I would like all of us to picture in our minds and have at the back of our minds this wonderful scene of the great controversy, the battle between good and evil, between God and Satan. It is against this backdrop that we have the book of Daniel, and in fact, every book in the Bible has been written. This background, in a way, helps us to see the events transpiring on this earth. And people in most religions are also able to understand this great controversy scenario. And so, presenting the book of Daniel with this context helps people to understand the book of Daniel and how it pertains to them. Our study today is chapter 4. In the last three chapters we have seen the predicament of God's people and especially focusing upon the Hebrew young people who were taken from Jerusalem in Judah to Babylon. And we saw in every chapter how God is at work. And when God's children make the decision for him, how they were successful. Today we want to continue to see how Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, going through this seesaw experience in this great controversy. In chapter 1, God used him as his instrument to teach Judah the important lessons they had to learn. And that is to obey the law of God, to be faithful in preserving the message that God has given to them and sharing them with others. On these fronts, we know Israel, God's people, have failed. Nebuchadnezzar seems to be responding to God's Holy Spirit working on him. In chapter 2, he is God's messenger, receiving the dream of the multi-metal image. And the chapter ends with Nebuchadnezzar acknowledging Daniel's God. In chapter 3, he tends to yield to Satan and his plans for him. We saw how Nebuchadnezzar desired that his kingdom should continue forever. Contrary to the plan of God that was revealed to him in chapter 2, that his kingdom was to pass away and another kingdom and more kingdoms were to follow. When he learns this lesson towards the end of the chapter, he had the special privilege of even seeing the Son of God. And he closes that episode with praises to the God of the Hebrew youth. In this chapter, we will see once again God revealing himself to them, to Nebuchadnezzar, about the judgment of God. Yet, this chapter, in passing on this judgment to King Nebuchadnezzar, God is gracious to him, shows him mercy, and that his grace is always available to him. And towards the end of the chapter, as we will see, he turns to God 
after the appointed time. And once again, he repeats his praise of God. What a wonderful display of the great controversy in an individual's life. Even a heathen king who responds to God and no one is left without God's ministry to them. In the great controversy, we see men and women not being steady always for God, but at times choose to be on the side of Satan. Even at such times, God's grace is granted to the erring ones, like Nebuchadnezzar, who was given 12 months of grace period after God warning him of the impending judgment that was to come upon him. And when grace was unheeded, we see Nebuchadnezzar having to experience God's judgment. He became an animal, and when he turns to God, at the end of the seven years, he was restored. What a wonderful experience that we see even in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. Beginning now, chapter 4, the first three verses, I invite you to look into your scriptures. Three, first three verses of chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Verse 3. How great are his signs, and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. In these three verses, we see Nebuchadnezzar once again proclaiming, declaring God's goodness to him. God's special interest in showing him great wonders and signs and how he realizes it is God's kingdom that is going to be an everlasting kingdom. Some scholars see these three verses to be actually the conclusion of chapter 3. Or well, could be a good introduction to chapter 4. But we see him actually, Nebuchadnezzar, the one who seems to be the writer of this chapter because we see him speak in first person. Or this chapter is written in first person. It could be that if Daniel was writing, he wrote it verbatim as the king had spoken these words or Nebuchadnezzar himself would have written this, this chapter. Reading verse 4 and 5. Note carefully, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts of my head on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. You could have noticed my emphasis on the personal pronoun, I, me, my, or eight times in these couple of verses. Nebuchadnezzar is using this personal pronoun. He speaks as if almost in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Lucifer, that cowering cherub in heaven, speaking such words against God and his desire to take the place of Jesus Christ, so obsessed with pride and ego, Lucifer lost his position because I would like to say the I problem. 
Likewise, here we see Nebuchadnezzar in this small little introductory speech. He seems to be having the same eye problem like Lucifer. You know, when we choose to be on the side of Satan, we begin to be like him. We begin to talk like him. We begin to act like him. But when we choose to be on the side of God, we will be like him as the prophet said, by beholding him, we become changed. Undoubtedly, the hero in this chapter is Nebuchadnezzar, who receives this second dream of a tree this time, the message of which is judgment on the king. This chapter seems to be a wonderful testimony and witness to God's changing power. Even a heathen idol worshiper being written in the first person, we see this chapter that Nebuchadnezzar seems to be the one who wrote this chapter. This chapter begins with praises to God for his wonderful deeds, but the dream is bad news for the king. He has to lose his empire and become an animal for seven years, after which time he realizes that it is the God of heaven who is in control of the world and his own life. It is not surprising that this successful monarch, so ambitious, so proud-spirited, should be tempted to turn aside from the path of humility, which alone leads to great, true greatness. In the interval between his wars of conquest, he gave much thought to the strengthening and beautifying of his capital, until at length the city of Babylon became the chief glory of his kingdom, the golden city, the praise of the whole earth. His passion as a builder and his signal success in making Babylon one of the wonders of the world. Ministered to his pride, his great achievements, thus leading him to this great danger of spoiling his own record. As a wise ruler that God could have continued to use as an instrument for carrying out the divine purpose. These are words from Ellen White. And so the great controversy theme, we see him here very much at work. In this battle between good and evil, every individual is an actor in this drama. And by the choices one makes, they show their allegiance either to God or to the devil. This happens every day as we respond to the promptings to belong to God or the devil. In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar was given the intimation of the plight that will come upon him if he did not respond to divine revelation and choose to be on the side of God in the period of grace that God offered to him. Nebuchadnezzar seems to be wavering between good, between God and Satan. Many times, that is also our position. We know what is right and God's will, but we at times tend to be on the side of Satan. Nebuchadnezzar was wavering. He was weak and was not able to make steady decisions and stick to them. Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the tree is again the case of a wise man of Babylon, not being able to interpret, or they were not prepared to give the meaning to the king. 
they knew that there was going to be some danger that is to come to the one that this vision was referring to, but they were not prepared. Lest if this was to refer to the king of Babylon, he knowing this message would even kill them. But it was for Daniel, who is able to interpret dreams me fearlessly and accurately. The king recognizes that only Daniel is able to interpret because the spirit of God of heaven is in him. This is in clear contrast between the wisdom Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Sorry, we had a little power breakdown. The great problem that we see of Nebuchadnezzar that led to lose his kingdom is the eye problem. He was boastful. He was egoistic. He was proud and likes to take all credit and glory to himself. This was the cause for the fall of Lucifer, the eye problem. As we see in chapter 4, we see Nebuchadnezzar going through such experience of trying to be great in his own eyes. Here is the vision in verse 10. I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of the earth. In this dream, we see prosperity that is witnessed in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. Its leaves were lovely, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar reached such superlative greatness because God had blessed him. God had shown him his mercy to be one who would be the recipient of God's great blessing and of receiving visions, God's messages. Nebuchadnezzar and his empire became a world power, controlling most of the world. He became strong as a tree that was planted by waters and giving shelter to the whole universe. And in this condition of self-praise and self-exaltation, the judgment of God was to come upon the king. And the divine judgment was executed by this heavenly watcher. The meaning of this dream cannot be easily missed. The strong tree being cut is judgment to be executed upon the king of destruction and an end. This being the meaning of the dream, 
the Babylonian wise men would have hesitated to give it to the king themselves, lest he may kill them. Since this was a news that is not acceptable to the king. But their thinking was, why take risk? Let Daniel take it for them. Yes, suddenly we see God's people taking up responsibility. God's people are the ones who are called upon in these last days. Others would put on God's people the blame for things happening in this world. But God's people will stand out. God's people will remain to be his channels. But the watcher was asked to leave the stump and to bind it. Thus, giving a chance for restoration and recovery. This is where how we see God's judgments. While he would like to correct the erring ones, he gives them opportunity, a second chance, a third chance, and if need be, more. God's punishment, punishments come along with his loving kindness and restoration. His punishments are salvific. It leads to repentance and salvation. A wonderful, loving God that we have, and even punishing us, would desire us to see, come back to him. Thus to the king, God was giving a second chance. God's advice was that he would, Daniel's advice, that he would turn away from his wrongful life to a life of doing good and obedient to God and assuring him of God's mercy and lengthening of his tranquility and prosperity. Operating in this situation, we see God's grace, a wonderful manifestation. After the warning that was given to Daniel by Nebuchadnezzar, he was given a period of grace of 12 months. At the end of this period, since Nebuchadnezzar did not change his ways from showing allegiance to Satan to following God, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling of my mighty power and the honor of my majesty? With this I problem, Nebuchadnezzar continues on to claim honor and the kingdom that he was called to rule and thus led to his downfall. Now, as we see in verse 34, and at the end of the time, after God giving him the 12 months period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. And my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Nebuchadnezzar comes to this wonderful conclusion. Because he acknowledges. But let's trace a little more to the verses 28 and 29. All that was said by Daniel concerning what would happen to him. Let's see the, the advice of Daniel. Therefore, O king, let my advice be accepted to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. In giving the interpretation, Daniel added this wonderful advice. This is what God's people in the great controversy are called upon to do, to advise the people who turn to God, to turn to God and remain faithful to him, to break off from the sins and to do righteously and to show mercy to the poor people. Thus, by doing so, his spirit of tranquility could continue on. But verse 28, let's see. And all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. All that what Daniel told him 
as an interpretation to this dream. Verse 29, at the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. And the king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? In speaking these great words of pomp and pride, see what happens, verse 31. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. So Nebuchadnezzar, after squandering the time of grace given to him, he had to face the consequence. Yes, God's grace always operates to restore his people from trials. We saw in chapter 3 when the Hebrew youth defied the king's order to bow down and worship the golden image, saying, Our God is able to deliver us. And if not, they will still not worship the golden image. These Hebrew youth knew the power of God to deliver them, but they knew that even if not, they would still not worship the golden image. Yes, the fiery furnace did not intimidate them, but they trusted God for deliverance. And there was God in their midst, protecting them and delivering them. Punishments that came upon Nebuchadnezzar because he failed to heed Daniel's advice. His kingdom was removed. He was driven from the living in the palace as a king to live as a wild beast. The chance of restoration was guaranteed when he looked to heaven once again, confessing, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Yes, God gives opportunity for everyone to make their decision and choice for God. He lets them go through times of struggle only to bring about a change. But we praise God for Nebuchadnezzar and others who use this redemptive punishment to turn to God. God's grace has not been wasted. The king, after the seven years of life as an animal, eating grass like an animal, wet with the dew of heaven, the king turns to God. The king turns and he says, and my reason returned to him. And the glory of my kingdom, my honor, all these once again were restored to King Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, when God's people would obey him, turn to him, God he is able to do a wonderful restoration to bring back the glory that they had and even greater glory. Yes, in great controversy, we see the two forces very much trying to gain control over human beings. This battle which is fought, which is fought in the mind of every person trying to win them. But it is every individual who is to make their decision for God. And we see Nebuchadnezzar turning to God once again. He received one tranquility and prosperity that has been promised to him because he looked to the God of heaven. In our problems and difficulties, we are not to look down to our own selves or to the conditions that are prevailing, but rather we are to look to God in heaven. We are to look to God from where our help comes from. And sure enough, God will accept people who respond to him, who turn back to him. At the end of the time, Nebuchadnezzar says, I lifted my eyes to heaven. That is where his help 
comes from. Restoration was assured to Nebuchadnezzar when he met the requirements. He lifted his eyes to heaven from where his help comes from. And all that the king lost, his kingdom, his wealth, everything was restored. And what does he do? He praises God. Verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways, justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. What a wonderful witness, a testimony to the experience that God has brought him to. A king who rejected God's warnings, who squandered God's grace, but once again, when God's spirit begins to work on him, he responds and he turns to God. And in being restored, Nebuchadnezzar did not fail to praise and honor God. This is the wonderful experience that we see of Nebuchadnezzar. Who is the hero in this great controversy scene? And he becomes the winner because he chooses to be on the side of God. And in his life, when he failed to accept God, he suffered. He received punishment, but when he turned back to God, he won victory for God. In the great controversy, people are tested. And when they do not meet expectations of God, they suffer punishment. But when they follow him, they will receive victory. Daniel, who becomes a wonderful servant of God in giving such interpretations and advising the king, thus turning that initial defeat of Nebuchadnezzar into a victory for God. Yes, the drama of the stage is the experience of chapter 4. But behind the curtains we see the unseen war between God and Satan. We have seen this seesaw, the pendulum swinging from one side to the other. When Nebuchadnezzar follows God, he is praising and glorifying but he swings to the other end, he rejects God's warnings, he suffers punishments, and eventually turns to God when he is restored and re-established. Yes, my friends, the great controversy is real, but yet unseen. But the victory or defeat depends on the choice one makes. Is it for God or for the enemy. The power exercised by every ruler on this earth is heaven imparted, the words of Ellen White. And upon the power, use of this power, thus bestowed, his success depends. And Nebuchadnezzar learned this lesson quite well. And even today, the rulers, not only of the political world, but even in our own church, are to exercise this power, this responsibility God placed upon them, that they are to use their power for God's work. To each the word of divine watcher is, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. God calls people not because they are worthy, but rather God picks people as they are and makes them worthy eligible for the work that he wants them to do. And to each, the words of Nebuchadnezzar of all are lessons for us. As Daniel warned him, break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquity by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. When we break off from our sins, when we turn away from the iniquities that we are indulging in, God's mercy will be shown to us. And definitely our period of prosperity 
will continue. The once proud monarch had become a humble child of God, the tyrannical, overbearing ruler, a wise and compassionate king, he who had defied and blasphemed the God of heaven, now acknowledged the power of the Most High and earnestly sought to promote the fear of Jehovah and the happiness of his subjects. These are the words of Ellen White. And we see here Ellen White highlighting God's wonderful work in the life of Nebuchadnezzar and how he becomes, as she calls, a child of God. This is the last time that we will hear of Nebuchadnezzar in this book. Because in chapter 5, we see a new king and the problem that he faces. But as we look at the life of Nebuchadnezzar in these four chapters, this heathen king who becomes a world monarch turns to God, responds to God's spirit speaking to him. God who used him as his instrument now becomes a messenger of God. And we see him going through the seesaw experience and the great controversy, but yet responds to God's loving call, God's warning messages. And what a change in the life of a person from being an animal because of his ego, his pride and self-exaltation, humbled to be an animal, but turns to God. And God's blessing of restoration was granted to him. Yes, this is a wonderful lesson for each one of us as well. Living in these days, in the last days, we are called to be like Daniel. Those who would turn people to God. And God will use us as his channels, as his instruments to lead people into God's kingdom. The good news is victory has always been wrought for people who choose God. The victory on the Calvary for us has been already achieved by Jesus Christ. We are on the side, on the winning side, because victory has been achieved and guaranteed. And when we choose so, we too will be on the side of victory. May God help each one of us through this experience of Nebuchadnezzar learn wonderful lessons that when we choose to be on the side of God, he will restore us. He will make us victorious. God bless us and have a wonderful Sabbath. Amen. Thank you, Roy, for the wonderful presentation. There are many points that he brought about that uh, should captivate our mind, that uh, God will give many chances. Let us not squander them, but always lift him up. We have uh, many prayer requests, and I will read them out today. And... You can remember them as you pray this Sabbath and beyond. Mr. Soda Dasi, who will have surgery tomorrow. Mr. and Mrs. Ratan Raj for healing. Pastor C.C. Nathaniel passed away today in India. Pray for the comfort of this family. Mrs. Julie Dondapati. This is Mary Nakka, T. Aruldas, Pastor and Mrs. Chandrakant Shinge, Mr. Mesafin, and the Children's Storybook Project that the Hopeside Women's Ministry has undertaken. And of course, for the growth and building of uh, the Hopeside Community Center. And so I would like to request uh, Dr. Roy Jamison to offer the closing prayer. Let's bow our heads in prayer. A gracious, loving, merciful, wonderful Father in heaven. This blessed Sabbath that you have granted to us as a day of rest from 
the labor of the week. We come into your hands because we know you're our great and loving father who desires the best for his people all the time. For giving us the Sabbath day that we can rest in thee from our physical labors, but also to rest from our lives, which many times are besetted by sin and the evil. Help us, Lord, that we may be restored as we look unto you for our hope, the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you for these wonderful Sabbath moments that we can come to worship you, that we can seek you, and we can receive help because we in faith believe that you're the only one who can hear and answer our prayers. We want to present before you, Lord, a list of prayer requests. You know each one individually, their problems and their needs. We pray for Pastor Dadasi, who will be having a surgery today. Touch him, Lord, and heal him. Restore him to complete health. And may your presence be in the whole procedures of his treatment. We pray for the bereaving family of Pastor C.C. Nathaniel, the great stalwart who ministered for you throughout his life. Bless every member. Comfort them. And we thank you for the wonderful assurance the blessed hope of our soon coming Savior when we shall meet our loved ones who have departed from us. Can you to bless them, Lord, and keep them in your care. We pray for El Ratan Raj and for his healing. Grant him, Lord, strength and health and the restoration that he needs. Bless his family as they continue to support him. May your grace be sufficient for them. We also remember Julie Dandapati, who is waiting for healing. Touch her as well. May your healing power be upon her and be healed and restored. We pray for Mary Naka and for her continued healing and restoration and bless her family too as they continue to support him. Remember Mr. T. Arundas for his healing as well and let your healing hand be upon him. In the same manner, we pray for Pastor Mrs. Chandrakan Shinge for the healing as well. Can you to grant them, Lord, power to overcome and be strengthened and healed. Likewise, Mr. Mispin, who is seeking for healing. Whatever each of their problems we know, Lord, you're the one who alone can, in your time, bring about healing and restoration for them. We pray for the storybook project for the Hopeside Women's Ministry. May all of those who are involved in this work be able to put forward the best in bringing out the storybook for your ministry among the children. We remember this church and pray for its growth, that many more may join and in their plans for building a church. May your grace be upon them. May the abundant blessing and generosity of people help in the building of this church. And through their ministry, many may be drawn into your kingdom. We thank you once again, O Father, for this privilege of listening to your word and offering our prayers, not because we are worthy, but you alone are. And we know that you're a God who hears and answers us because we believe and trust you. Thank you for hearing our prayers and answering us and committing each one once again into your loving hands. Pray for every member who was present today and for their families and grant them, Lord, all the desires of their heart that they may continue to be a support to this church and lead many people into your saving kingdom. Bless us and keep us faithful to thee and lead us throughout our lives because we ask all this blessing in the loving name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the message and also praying for all the names listed. Next week, I will not be here. I'll be going to that Nuzwid 100th year anniversary reunion kind of celebration in uh, uh, Loma Linda area, arranged by 
Dr. Johnny Thomas and many from Newswit who are there. So they asked, or they invited many, including me. So I'll be going there next week. So it will, there will not be a verse verse next week, but the following week, uh, we will continue in the book of Daniel. And so now let us uh, meet and greet. Thank you all for joining. Invite others to this great study on the book of Daniel. Thank you, Roy, for that beautiful message. How often we like Nebuchadnezzar have that eye problem. If we can only remove that eye problem and give all glory to God, we could live a victorious life and enjoy a little heaven upon this earth. Um, I'd like to thank Pastor Alfred Raju, Ajay Kumar, and I saw another phone number from India joining. I don't know the name. Um, thank you for joining our Vespers and happy Sabbath to all. Thank you, Akar. God bless you in your ministry. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy, for this beautiful message. As you were preach, uh, teaching us, I was uh, reflecting on how God is merciful even to the heathens, giving them chances. Sometimes we think that only Christians will be saved and only Adventists will be saved. Uh, no, like we are better off. God uh, is our God, you know. So this this is a proof that God will be merciful to all the people, no matter which religion they belong to. And God gives them all chances. So um, I, I had never thought about this before. So thank you for sharing uh, uh, that God gives chances to everyone, no matter who they are. Right. Yes, I think that's really a wonderful uh, eye opener to us that God has his people in every culture, in every community, even in every yeah. religion. Though yes. we may see them from a heathen religion, but God does speak to people and we see them respond. And God has definitely a place for all of them in gospel proclamation. And in the final days, all of these will come out of their churches, out of their religions, their cultures, and finally join God's end time remnant who will be ready, prepared, and we will have many surprises in that end time when we see many of such people join us for the second coming. Amen. Yes. <clears throat> Praise God. Roy, as usual, this was a wonderful presentation in this evening. We, it's amazing because when we look at um, King Nebuchadnezzar, the you know, a king who was on the top, you know, and how yeah. he falls, how God humbles him and all that is amazing. And then as growing up, I recollect we saying, I donkey last. You remember? Mm -hmm. You know, we'll say, put I donkey last. Because then that's what we should always do. Put that I last. You know, yeah. don't even bring it up in the front. So... And that was what we used to do. But thank you. It was wonderful. God bless you, Premier, and your family. Thank you.